Have you ever had a rock collection or perhaps maybe even a rock garden? When I was a little kid, I used to keep a rock collection next to the house where I grew up. I don't remember it very well, and I don't recall it ever being very big. But my mother hated it for some reason. It might have been because while I saw this, she actually saw this. And it's probably because whenever I found a rock, she was the one carrying it back home. Whatever the case may be, it's safe to say that I've always been very interested in the diversity of rocks out there. Fast forward to today, and you would find that my collection has grown considerably. It now takes up a few rooms in my office and has grown to include not just rocks, but also minerals, fossils, and sediment samples too. But what differences do we actually see when we look closely at rocks? Why do these differences exist? And where do all the rocks on Earth actually come from? Let's explore. You have probably heard that there are three types of rocks. Igneous rocks, sedimentary rocks, and metamorphic rocks. These rocks have different physical properties because they have different origins. Magma migrates upward through the Earth, where it may cool beneath the surface, becoming an intrusive igneous rock. Magma may also rise and erupt from the surface of the planet at volcanoes. When magma reaches the surface of the planet through volcanic vents, we call it lava. As lava cools, it turns into what we call an extrusive igneous rock. As you can therefore see, geologists distinguish between extrusive igneous rocks, which form when magma comes out as lava and cools on the surface, and intrusive igneous rocks, which form when magma cools beneath the surface. Intrusive igneous rocks occur inside other igneous rocks, and they also occur inside sedimentary and metamorphic rocks. Sedimentary rocks are the focus of sedimentology and stratigraphy for reasons that will soon become apparent to you. This is the reason that sedimentology and stratigraphy are collectively known as sedimentary geology. Sedimentary rocks come from sediment. Deep in the earth, under high temperature and pressure, Grains of sediment, like sand, clay, and mud, become glued together, hardening into a solid sedimentary rock. Interestingly enough, the opposite is also true. There are a variety of natural processes that break sedimentary rocks down into sediment. Sandstone is an example of a sedimentary rock. It forms from sand grains, sand, a sediment. You can feel these grains on the surface of sandstone, which has a rough, coarse texture, like sandpaper. This is meaningful. It tells us that we can recognize sedimentary rocks by both feel and appearance. If you touch a sedimentary rock, you will usually feel grains. If you look closely at a sedimentary rock, you will usually see the grains. This is a type of sedimentary rock that we call a conglomerate. Conglomerates have large grains and particles of sediment, so they are easy to recognize. You can see the grains in this conglomerate with the unaided eye. In sandstones and other types of sedimentary rocks, the grains are smaller and harder to see. In these cases, you need to use tools to examine the rocks. One of the most indispensable tools for a geologist is called a hand lens. 
A hand lens is basically just a very small and a very practical magnifying glass. It's pretty common to find geologists with these hand lenses tied around their necks in the field. In the laboratory, there are other options. Geologists often study the minerals and grains in sedimentary rocks by preparing them as petrographic thin sections for microscopic analysis. A thin section is a slice of rock that is so thin that the light of a microscope can pass through it. As you can see in this example of a petrographic thin section prepared from a sandstone, the rock consists of many small grains with angular shapes. In this specific case, the geologist who prepared the thin section used a blue dye to help show where the spaces between the grains are located. So what exactly does it take to turn sediment into sedimentary rock like this one? Sediment accumulates in layers called strata. Imagine pouring sands of various colors into a jar or some other sort of glass cylinder. After you pour the sand, it will eventually stop moving. We call this deposition. Deposition happens when wind, water, or gravity stops transporting material and it begins to accumulate as loose sediment. When you stop pouring the sand, it becomes deposited as a layer or stratum. Now, change the color of your sand and repeat the process. You will notice that your deposits are visible as different layers. These strata record the sequence of events as you changed going from black to white to brown to purple sand and so forth. Even if you didn't pour the sand yourself, you could figure out the sequence of events. A white layer must have been poured after a black stratum beneath it. We will ultimately use this knowledge to do stratigraphy, but let's save that discussion for another day. When sediment begins its journey to becoming a rock, it is loosely packed and contains a lot of air or water, like the sand in our jars. Picture wet sand on the beach. Now, obviously, this must change. After all, rock contains very little water, only very minor amounts. Sediment turns into rock through a process called lithification. You may find many similar words in sedimentary geology, such as lithology, lithogenous, lithosphere. They all come from the Greek word lithos, meaning stone. Lithification entails compaction and cementation of sediment. Compaction occurs when strata pile up over time, adding weight on top of sediment. This added weight compresses the sediment, reducing the thickness of the layers and squeezing out any water or air that is present. As a layer of wet sand is compacted, it becomes thinner and loses much of its water. Cementation is the gluing of sediment grains together. The glue, or cement, consists of minerals that form and grow between the grains. These cements fill in the spaces between the particles and turn the loose sediment into solid rock. What causes this process of cementation? Fluids moving between the grains may experience a change in temperature or pressure, resulting in a chemical reaction that allows a mineral to grow. Chemical reactions caused by microscopic organisms can also create cements. It's not uncommon to find a variety of minerals in the spaces between the grains of a sedimentary rock. The opposite of compaction and cementation are weathering and erosion, 
which destroy sedimentary rocks. Weathering is the process that actually breaks a sedimentary rock down into smaller pieces. Weathering is a lot like the process that causes potholes and cracks in the sidewalk to form in the winter. Water seeps down into the road, sidewalk, or dirt and freezes. Because water expands when it freezes, it exerts a force on the road or sidewalk, causing it to fracture and to break. With rocks, we would refer to this process as a form of physical or mechanical weathering. Mechanical weathering is any natural process that breaks a rock down into smaller pieces through direct physical contact. Freeze thawing is one of the most common forms of mechanical weathering, particularly in regions with cold climates. Whenever water freezes inside of a crack within a rock, it expands and causes the crack to widen. When the ice melts, the water flows potentially deeper into the rock where it may again freeze, causing further damage. Geologists like to differentiate between physical weathering and chemical weathering. Chemical weathering occurs whenever a chemical is responsible for the breakdown of a rock. There are many types of chemical weathering. Acid rain, for example, may expose rocks to acids, which may dissolve their minerals. Organisms produce chemicals that are also detrimental to rocks. Plants in particular release chemicals from their roots, which allow them to dissolve the surfaces of rocks and grow on top of them. Even the oxygen in the atmosphere may react with certain iron bearing minerals, causing rocks to turn to rust and disintegrate. Regardless of the cause, weathering is usually followed by erosion, which is the transport of rock fragments away from their place of origin. The main agents of erosion are gravity, wind, flowing water, and ice. Fragments move downhill and may be carried by wind, rivers, or glaciers to other locations. So you've learned about the first two types of rock. That just leaves metamorphic rocks, which are derived from igneous and sedimentary rocks. The recipe for a metamorphic rock is pretty straightforward. Simply take an igneous or sedimentary rock add heat and pressure and cook it until it is done. This process is called metamorphism. Metamorphism destroys and transforms minerals. Sedimentary minerals are replaced by metamorphic ones and sedimentary rocks become metamorphic rocks. For example, sandstone, a classic sedimentary rock, becomes quartzite. Quartzite takes its name from its high concentration of the mineral quartz, which it derives from the sandstone. Metamorphism is a lot like cooking in your kitchen. If you want to cook something, you will either add the heat of a fryer or an oven or a pan or grill, or you will put your ingredients in a pressure cooker, which works by removing the air and cooking food at high internal pressures. This allows you to cook at very high temperatures. Of course, the cooking process doesn't make metamorphic rocks indestructible by any means. Indeed, all types of rocks, igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary, are capable of being destroyed through melting. Temperatures and pressures deep inside of the earth are capable of melting any rock. It is possible to overcook your metamorphic rocks. Clearly, there are many processes that connect igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic rocks to each other. We refer to these relationships as the rock cycle. All of the processes are represented in the cycle, metamorphism, melting, cooling, lithification, 
and weathering and erosion. The rock cycle is our model of how materials are recycled among the rocks on our planet. How our, our planet recycles and reuses its minerals despite ever-changing landscapes on the surface. Over eons of Earth history, you could conceivably track an atom of silicon from the sediment to magma across many transformations of rock. Now that you've reviewed the rock cycle, the next step in your training as a sedimentary geologist will be to learn how to identify these rocks by sight and feel. And more importantly, to begin to recognize all the diversity and variation that exists among sedimentary rocks.